Whether it's the death of a single child or climate change, our overwhelming instinct is to find someone to blame when things go wrong. Well, sometimes there absolutely is someone to blame, but often it's complicated and yet we simplify and blame anyway. Why do we do that? Does it help or harm our chances of changing the world for the better? Let's discuss. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. A couple of days ago, I got into a Twitter exchange where having highlighted my previous video, Dear Young People, where I argued against the line that the older generation had failed the younger in terms of dealing with climate change, I got this tweet from someone who's been active on sustainability issues and corporate responsibility. Our generation should feel deep shame here in the UK for how little we have done, brackets, much of which enforced on us by EU directives, the kids are right to call us out. And I say this as someone who has been active on this for 30 years. Now there's some Brexit stuff mixed up in there, along with the generational stuff, because after all, he's turned a broad generational point into a geographically specific generational point. Although if you ask Greta who he's referencing, I don't think she's arguing that the EU or any other national representatives of the older generation have done a great job. So let's discard the distractions of that for the purpose of this discussion to focus on that shame element. Now I'll come back to the climate change example in due course. Let's begin by noting just how much we as a species demonstrate this powerful drive to blame. If you look at how we do it, it shows one or two interesting insights into why we do it. Let's take a few smaller, more concrete examples. In 2003, a Dutch nurse, Lucia de Burke, was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of four children under her care and the attempted murder of three others. The evidence was flimsy, but they looked at what had happened to children who she'd had contact with, and one expert testified that there was a 1 in 342 million chance of deaths of that number of babies while a single nurse was on duty. They said that, That degree of improbability meant you could safely have a lower burden of proof. Now, it turned out the maths was wrong. And actually, it was more likely to be a 1 in 25 chance, although other calculations suggested a 1 in 1 million chance. How many hospitals are there in the world? With how many paediatric nurses? Who look after how many children each? I think we can safely say that 1 in 25 chances happen in that world all the time. And indeed, even 1 in a million chances, often enough for it to be relatively normal. But her conviction wasn't about a mathematical mistake, as Sean Carroll pointed out in his book, The Big Picture. He said this, What started the ball rolling was a psychological conviction. The idea that something as horrible as these infant deaths couldn't just be random. Someone must be to blame. There must be a reason why it happened. As horrible as the death of a child necessarily is, it becomes more sensible to us if it can somehow be explained as the result of someone's actions rather than simply random chance. Now, another example would be the death of baby P. 17-month-old Peter Connolly was killed by months of cruelty at the hands of his mother, Tracy, and her boyfriend, Stephen. He'd suffered over 50 injuries at the time of his death. In that case, blame was appropriate, and the recipients of it were obvious, the people who caused the death. However, various agencies, such as the police, social services and health services, had come into contact with him in the last few months, and a case review concluded the death could have been prevented by those services and that mistakes had made, been made across all of them. Very quickly, the media and politicians decided to focus on one service, specifically the social services, and one person, the woman who was the head of the social services. In spite of all of the contemporary evidence that she was highly regarded as a leader and she'd done good things, she became the target of a very high-profile and vicious campaign, largely because the leader then of the opposition, David Cameron, wanted to weaponise the blame for political purposes. So the focus didn't go on to how the system might change, just on the moral crusade to replace the person at the top. Inevitably, of course, she was replaced. And by all accounts, the impact in the aftermath was a lot worse as a result. Fear gripped social workers across the country, who started overzealously taking children into care at the first sign of trouble. So scared were they of being held publicly accountable should something happen that was realistically completely out of their control. 
And the trauma of losing your child because social services intervened when they shouldn't, well, that wasn't making newspaper headlines. And so a lot of harm was done. Now, of course, that head of social services took the government to court over what happened and won because it had been demonstrably unfair. But by then she was a hate figure. So many people were furious that she'd won a financial settlement, when as far as they were concerned, she was more responsible for the death of Baby P, even the people who actually tortured him to death. Their names have been forgotten, long before hers has been. These are just a couple of examples, but we see this sort of thing time and time again. And there does seem to be a basic assumption, above and beyond just, here's a bad thing, someone's to blame. Because after all, in the Baby P example, there clearly was someone to blame, but it wasn't enough. It seems to come from this assumption that in a well-ordered society, these things shouldn't happen. There's a mass shooting, the killer's to blame, of course, but we immediately have a debate about the role of gun control policy and whether it could prevent such things in the future. Someone dies of cancer, we wonder if it's the result of a failed screening service and or medical malpractice. There's a terrorist attack, and at least the second question we ask is whether the security services were at fault, because surely they should have picked this up before it happened. Random individuals taking action is something we can't control for. So we assume that really it's the failure of a system, and somebody associated with that system can be sacked. Just listen to the way the news is discussed, every day. Whenever something happens, see how long it takes before someone's pondering the question of who's to blame outside of the actual causal actors. It doesn't mean we can't seek to design systems to minimise bad things from happening, but that's a different question to blame. It's when you get blame without curiosity to the causes that it mitigates against making things better. Blame the head of social services. Turn her into public enemy number one. What lessons do we learn? None. We assume once she's gone, the problem's gone, which is only true if she was actually the cause of the problem. It's different to accountability. In accountability, you can say, what went wrong? How can we fix it? And generally, you do that better without blame. Great sports people understand this. Every tennis player who won a Grand Slam only ever got there by losing many times to better players. The great ones always try to work out why did they lose? Because there's a set of controllable variables to how, how you hit the ball, how you move, how you anticipate, how you cope with environmental factors like the sun being in your eyes or a noisy crowd. You can blame the fact that you lost because, oh, somebody called out when I made that serve at break point. But how you deal with adversity is one of the things you can train for. So if you take accountability, you build it into your training regime. Blame has no part to play. Great businesses also understand this. And the best ones go to great lengths to cultivate a blame-free culture in their workforce on the basis that you can only learn from mistakes if you can identify them and discuss them openly and honestly. If you blame people for getting things wrong, then they'll do everything they can to cover their back and, if possible, to blame others. Now, in that circumstance, you won't learn what was the real problem and so you won't be able to make the right change. It's a difficult challenge because the instinct to blame is so hardwired into us. Those businesses have to go to great lengths to break that instinct. I've had this experience myself. When I was at the CSR organisation Business in the Community, I was asked to take over an IT team in crisis because the organisation's computer setup had been in catastrophic failure mode for at least five years. And in actual fact, that problem was relatively easy to solve if you research basic IT governance. The organisation just had to centralise IT spending, buy one computer of a high quality nature, replace it every three years. Almost all the problems went away because the organisation stopped buying a huge diversity of cheap junk. Who'd have guessed? But I could not get that IT team to adopt the blame-free culture. And I tried for two years. I failed. Why? Because they'd spent the previous five years being blamed for everything that went wrong. And you don't get to shake that off in just a few months, even once the blame has subsided. So anyway, this is all very well. How does this relate to the climate change example and that whole issue of generational blame? Well, it's interesting because there are some differences here. As far as I can tell, this started out as self-blame amongst environmentalists. I was certainly hearing all sorts of people talking about how we had failed the younger generation before I heard the younger generation repeating that line back to us. 
And that shouldn't really be surprising because young people in every other context often take their cues from their elders, even when they're rebelling against them. Indeed, referring back to the tweet that prompted me to do this video, that was absolutely the language. We should be ashamed. Now, in that individual's case, it may just be an example of virtue signalling because he went on to boast about some of the great contributions he'd made. But for many adults, there's no doubt that there is a sincere self-blame that is contributing to their perspective. Self-blame is a different process to standard blame. Standard blame is basically one of externalising accountability. I missed my shot at tennis. That person in the next court distracted me. Or as Dr Brené Brown put it in her TED talk, I spilled my coffee. That's my husband's fault because he was home later last night than he promised and that meant I got less sleep than I needed and I'm tired and therefore I knocked the coffee over. It's a way of getting out our anger and irritation that doesn't require us to take responsibility. But alternatively, self-blame has been described by psychologists as one of the most toxic forms of self-abuse. Now, we see that and understand it in different contexts. We're used to seeing rape victims blaming themselves, and we know that they're wrong to do that. We, we're used to depressed people concluding that they're complete failures because of one thing that went wrong in their lives, and we try to talk them out of that mindset and show them why they're so valuable as a person. And with climate change, it came about as a natural consequence of the rhetoric over decades that these issues were all about how to protect the interests of future generations. Future generations are stakeholders in some of the decisions of today. They don't have a voice at the table. Campaigners, therefore, have for decades tried to suggest that they were that voice, even though it's a conceit, really, because you have no way of knowing how the world will appear to future generations. But then it's gone beyond that, because when the youth movements on climate change became a thing, the rhetoric of those campaigners was picked up by the youngsters themselves. And it's impossible now to trace this back as to whether it was simply that they heard dear old David Attenborough say it and it took hold, or whether some of the more aggressive campaign groups who have associated themselves with the school strikers actively coached it as part of the Us versus Them focus that is their left-wing inspired strategy. I don't know. Either way, the end result is that intergenerational blame, as well as blame against so-called elites, has become weaponized as part of the movement. Now, the baby P example shows how unintended consequences can come when blame is weaponized. And that's by no means unique. In, in fact, if you go back through history, you'll find loads of other examples large and small. On the large side, the French Revolution arguably came about as the drip feed of poisonous propaganda about the profligate lifestyles of the royal family, particularly Marie Antoinette, and that this was to blame for the conditions of the poor. And, you know, was there a shortage of bread because of a recent drought? Well, that royal family and their allies are almost certainly stockpiling grain in order to drive prices up to make more obscene amounts of money. And you add to those stories the ones about all the immoral and scandalous practices to dehumanise those people. And then ultimately you can mobilise people to act against them. And of course act they did. Royal heads were taken by the guillotine as a result. Did it solve a problem? No. The poor remained poor. There were no secret storehouses of grain. So the people that did the first round of killing became the second round of victims. And then the people who did the second round of killing became the third round of victims. Because ultimately, the cause of the problem had been incorrectly attributed. And the action taken actually destroyed some of the things that did work. And so made the system even worse than it was before. And those parallels are quite concrete, to be honest, because some of the solutions being put forward today by the radical campaigners for climate change would destroy institutions that have been built over centuries of learning what works and what doesn't. Revolutions in history have often done that. Destroying what came before is assumed to be destroying the corruption and the people that are the problem. And it's generally made things worse, as you then have to build a complete system with today's resources, rather than building on the top of wisdom and learning and the physical assets accumulated over time. So weaponized blame, pretty bad vehicle for achieving positive change. Self-blame, equally unproductive. The alternative to self-blame is self-acceptance. Understanding that humans are imperfect and have failings, rather than moralizing those failings, allowing for them, forgiving them, working out how to make things work in spite of them. 
when the US founders crafted the Constitution of, of America, they did so in the belief that humans tend to corruption in the face of power. So they devised a system with power balanced across different areas with checks and balances built in. It's not a perfect system because it was designed and run by imperfect humans, but it's been pretty enduring because it does indeed cope reasonably well with the failings of leaders. They took personal responsibility for how their system will be required to cope with human failings. Now, personal responsibility doesn't mean self-blame. It means you understand that you have the power to act positively. And you can also choose whether you focus on just the bad things or whether you focus on the good things as well. Was that previous generation uniquely awful because they created climate change and did nothing comparable that was good? We know that we look badly now on parents who only ever tell their children how terrible they are and how they'll never match their peers. I mean, we'd condemn such an approach to parenting out of hand. It's exactly what we're doing generationally when it comes to climate change. I mean, I pointed this out in the Dear Young People video, that the current generation solved many problems and has put humanity into a better current state than it has ever been at any time in history. And the point is this, Really, this was a predictable outcome, as are the problems of success that we now have to deal with. Humans in aggregate respond to their environment and the attitudes of their time in broadly predictable ways. If you took today's generation of individuals and put them back 40 years, knowing only what we knew and thought then, they would in aggregate have done exactly the same things. Pull them back another 200 years and they'd have done exact same things that the people did then. The only things that change generation to generation are the environment into which they are born and the attitudes of the society in which they grow up. Now, that doesn't mean that we should adopt fatalism. It doesn't mean that whatever's going to happen will just happen and we don't need to personally bother ourselves with it. Because individual leaders have often hastened the changing of an attitude or the ending of an injustice. These changes might have happened anyway, but they don't happen by themselves and how they happen does matter. If Gandhi hadn't existed, India still wouldn't now be ruled by Britain. I mean, the whole direction of history has been that people become self-determining. Might have happened a bit later. It might have happened rather differently. I mean, we don't actually know whether it might not have happened better. We just don't have a privilege of knowing. If Martin Luther King hadn't been involved, it's still almost certain that civil rights would have been achieved. It might not have been peaceful to the degree that it was. It might have been uglier and messier on both sides. It would have happened, but leaders make a difference. If the founding fathers of the US hadn't done such a great job of framing the Constitution, America would still be self-governing today. They might, like Canada, still have the British Queen as their head of state, maybe. They might be split into more than one country. That nearly happened several times. They'd still ultimately have abolished slavery. They'd still be self-governing. That was always going to happen. Perhaps with some great leadership that we didn't have, it would have happened sooner. Skill in execution matters in history. The free nations could have lost the Second World War. Probably the Nazi tyranny would have been overthrown eventually because people consistently want to be free. But the skill of those fighting in the war determined the short-term outcome and it was worth doing. So no... Fatalism is not a thing. Human beings only collectively take action when the circumstances impress themselves on them sufficiently to prompt the response. Let's not waste time by saying, oh, others should have done it first. Let's take responsibility and ask for questions informed by this history. One, how do we frame the problem based on reality so that we don't pursue the wrong solutions with unintended consequences? Two, how do we arrive at the solutions correctly? So we achieved the US Constitution solution, not the French Revolution one. And three, how do we play our part with skill and leadership to be successful in making the changes we need to make? I think it's the mark of greatness in any person that they want to leave the world better than they found it. Regardless of what you think is the problem in the world that you want to contribute to solving, those are the three questions you need to answer to be an effective agent for change. 